Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. My name is Ed Tarpley. I'm an attorney from Louisiana. I represented Stuart Rhodes in the first Oath Keeper trial along with Lee Bright and Phil Linder from Dallas, Texas. Today, we're gathered here for our friend Steve Baker. Steve is a journalist. He is an investigative journalist with Blaze Media here in Dallas, Texas. But on the day of January 6th, Steve was a journalist, an independent journalist, videoing and reporting from Washington, D.C., inside the Capitol, and uh, he did a great job. Since that time, Steve has been uh, interviewed by uh, the FBI, uh, has received uh, communications from the Department of Justice about his possible arrest uh, in connection with uh, the uh, uh, journalism that he uh, conducted on the day of January 6th. Uh, earlier this week on Monday, uh, uh, several attorneys uh, issued a press conference on behalf of Steve Baker. Uh, I'm here today as one of those attorneys. We also have Matthew Saradini from North Carolina, who is uh, the longtime attorney for Steve Baker. We have Mr. James Lee Bright from Dallas, Texas. We have Mr. Uh, Brad Geyer from the state of New Jersey. Uh, and we are here today to uh, further amplify what we said on Monday in our press release. And that is that we are here for the freedom of the press and to protect the constitutional liberties that we have in this country. We're defending freedom of the speech, freedom of press, and for the ability of citizens to operate as journalists, to report the news, report events that are taking place in our country without fear of intimidation or coercion uh, by the federal government. And uh, I'm here to say to you that we proudly stand with Steve Baker to defend him, defend his rights as a citizen, uh, defend the freedom of the press, defend him as a journalist. Uh, and I'm honored to stand here with these uh, gentlemen today. At this time, I'm going to turn over the mic to Mr. Matthew Saradini from the state of North Carolina, who will further comment on what we are doing here today for Steve Baker. Matthew. Uh, thank you, Ed. Uh, my name is Matthew Cherodini. I'm here uh, from Raleigh, North Carolina. Um, I have known Mr. Baker since uh, 2021, contacted me in the summertime. Uh, we have a mutual friend uh, who I've also done work for, and he asked me to represent Mr. Baker in an FBI interview. And normally what I would have said is uh, you shouldn't talk to the cops, but Mr. Uh, Baker has done a lot of journalism when one happened on January 6th that day. He had done a lot of blog posts, had posted a lot of videos, a lot of commentary. And we came to the decision that, well, this would be best just to get on the record and clarify exactly why you were there, what you saw, uh, and make sure that it, there, there's a, an official record with the FBI about this. So we consented to the interview and then when I told the U.S. Attorney's Office that, yes, Mr. Baker was there in a capacity as a journalist, they then said, oh, well, we'll have to reschedule this because we need to see whether or not there are First Amendment implications. Clearly, there were. But they did come back and hold the interview. We interviewed with the FBI. And then from that point forward, we expected to hear more about possible charges that were going to be coming but they kept getting delayed over and over and over again. Um, we were always compliant. We always uh, consented to whatever information that they wanted. We complied with their subpoenas. We did their interviews. And I would receive over the years many calls to say, okay, well, now's the time that we think that he uh, will be charged and he'll need to self-surrender. And when that day finally came, or as we got closer to that day, they said, oh, well, something came up, we're going to have to uh, postpone that, we'll let you know. Well, Mr. Baker has been living under this threat for the past over two and a half years now. We think it's unwarranted. He was there in the capacity as a journalist. He was there uh, exercising his First Amendment right. And we don't believe that the charges would be uh, well-founded at all. Therefore, we're asking that the DOJ drop this investigation, stop sh overshadowing him, and uh, just allow him to be the journalist that he is. And I just want to say that I'm very proud to be here with Mr. Baker and the other attorneys uh, representing him. Um, and we hope that justice will prevail. Thank you. Good afternoon. Thank you for being here. My name is James Lee Bright. I'm a local criminal defense attorney. 
I had the pleasure of meeting Steve about a year and a half ago, just a bit over when I was able to and lucky enough to practice in DC for a while representing Stuart Rhodes for the Oath Keepers. Steve was a regular contributor and member of the press, reported fairly and evenly on our trials and in every other trial that I've seen him cover. I'm honored to be part of the group that will be defending Steve and standing here before you on his behalf. Steve, if you will please follow what he writes, follow his reporting, do so. It is enlightening and he is starting to show cracks in the armor and people do not like this. He has proven that at least two of the government witnesses in our trial committed perjury. It is video evidence. It has been proven. And there are people that do not like what Steve is showing you. And as part of his defense team and honored to stand here before you today, we will stand by him to, sh to, to stand up for the First Amendment and his right as a journalist to continue these lines of investigation. Thank you very much. Thank you, Lee. My name is Brad Geyer. I'm proud to call Steve Baker my friend. I think Steve Baker is one of the most effective and talented journalists that we have in America today. And it saddens me greatly that we're talking about, we're basically beseeching the United States Department of Justice not to charge this very talented journalist and let him continue in his work. We shouldn't be here having this press conference. We should be having a press conference of him receiving a Pulitzer Prize for the reporting that he's done. I represented Ken Harrelson in the Oath Keepers trial. Ken Harrelson is completely innocent. Thankfully, he's going to be released as early as this weekend. The reporting that Steve did, we as Oath Keepers Defense Counsel were so disturbed by what we saw regarding the testimony of Officer Harry Dunn and the testimony of Agent Lazarus that, frankly, I think I speak for the group, at least as it relates to Kenneth Harrelson, against whom the United States government's case was the weakest, that I believe that he would walk, he would not have been convicted had Agent Lazarus and Harry Dunn not provided false testimony. If the AUSAs had been provided that by the U.S. Capitol Police, they never would have put those witnesses on. If the AUSAs would have received that information and decided to put him on, they would have provided it to us. In any event, they would have provided it to us as Brady information. In all my interactions with the U.S. Attorney's Office and the Department of Justice in my January 6 cases, all the line assistants acted professionally and with a uh, uh, perfect ethical sensibility. My concerns relate to enforcement policy of the United States Department of Justice. Although he can't be here today, William Shipley is also on our combined defense. I am a proud former Fed of 21 years experience. I th I'm not sure if I have an extra year on Bill Shipley or he has an extra year on me, but what we are seeing as alumni of the Department of Justice, is we find profoundly troubling. We both, I believe, have deep concerns about the thrust of United States enforcement policy as it applies to this case and it applies to enforcement on behalf of the United States more generally. As I was preparing for today's press conference, I kind of lost track of the news, and I happen to notice that down here on the border we have a, a, a growing dispute between a governor of the state of Texas, there's other states that are joining, and it involves border enforcement. When you have millions of people crossing over the border causing tens of thousands of violent crimes against Americans, how do you have the resources to go after a journalist? This is completely outrageous. And that's why we're here in Dealey Plaza. We are here in Dealey Plaza because what we're dealing with has enormous magnitude. Everybody needs to take a deep breath, step back to neutral corners, check out our enforcement policy. Is it really driven 
to protect the American people against, against actual threats? Is it really geared to creating the kind of American exceptionalism and uh, that, that uh, continually revives the American experience? And I would submit to you that it doesn't. And I call out to my former colleagues, career civil servants, ask around in the Department of Justice, ask around in the Inspectors General, ask around in the FBI. They will tell you that I've been a tireless supporter and advocate for career civil servants. And I'm calling out to you today, you need to help within your agencies to get these agencies rebalanced, to get them restored, to get them rehabilitated, to get them back within, uh, within norms that have been established over decades. We need your help. We all know that the vast majority of restoration that occurs is gonna happen behind the scenes, behind closed doors. We need your help. I think we're gonna get over 1,300 January 6 takedowns. Some involve voluntary surrender, not enough. We're talking about 20 and 30 agents deployed to a location to do a hard tactical arrest with sniper, on occasion, sniper teams, up armored vehicles. We've heard multiple stories of a husband and wife walking out with hands up. The husband looks over at the wife and her chest is emblazoned by laser dots. This is the United States Department of Justice. This is the United States. Check out your rules of engagement. What is going on? Why are you pointing weapons at things that you don't intend to shoot? Enough. And today I stand before you to emphasize the fundamental importance of protecting our fundamental rights, particularly as it relates to investigative journalism, our freedom of speech, press, and the right to gather and disseminate information are the bedrock of a democratic society. However, we find ourselves at a crossroads where the allocation of resources towards certain areas of enforcement risks diverting attention from critical issues that pose significant threats to American prosperity. Steve Baker and his camera that captured the events of the day are not a threat to the United States. And his investigative journalism played a crucial role in holding those in power accountable. Journalists like Steve Baker are the watchdogs of our democracy, shining a light on corruption, injustices, and abuses of power. We sat there during the entire Oath Keeper trial. In my opinion, 95% of the germane, the reporting that was actually reporting on what was actually happening in the courtroom came from one guy. And as we celebrate the power of the press, we must also address the concerning trend of diverting resources towards cases that are not imminent threats to the nation. The, the events of January 6th undoubtedly deserved some kind of inquiry, deserve some kind of investigation. However, the emphasis placed in these cases came at the expense of other pressing issues. Even the former Attorney General, William Barr, has pointed out that if the same level of attention was given to January 6th, was extended to other areas of crime, our nation would be the safest in the world but it's clearly not now. I am here not necessarily just for me today. I am here for the other independent journalists that were there on January 6th doing their job, that were not there to riot, that were not there to inflict harm on law enforcement or do property damage, or to walk around the building and chanting and making even their voices heard. But for those guys who have been charged and convicted and some imprisoned, for the very activities that I did that day. Unfortunately for those guys, they did not have behind them a, a team that has come and rallied behind me of that quality. Unfortunately, they have not had as well a nor news organization of the size and with the bullhorn uh, voice of Blaze Media to back them up. And so I'm here for them today, first and foremost. I wanna talk about First of all, the difference in journalism today and what it was and what they now 
expect it to be. And the way that the, the, the government still portrays it in trial is this arcane beast that you have to work for some hallowed organization like the Washington Post or the New York Times or the Associated Press or the UPI or CNN or MSNBC, or you're not qualified as a journalist. You have to have a specific license or a designation or a certificate or a badge or a press pass of some sort in order for your voice to be valid. But see, that's the old world as it is today when you're somebody like myself who three years ago had a Facebook following of 40,000 followers, that's larger, you understand, than most small town newspapers. As a matter of fact, in those days before Facebook started um, suppressing speech and, and throttling our reach because of the COVID uh, restrictions that were happening at the time, my articles to 40,000 subscribers were seen by average of 150,000 people, sometimes over a million, depending upon whether they went viral or not. That's the new media. That's where we're at today. So you can't come to us, Department of Justice. You can't come to me, FBI. You can't come to me, Assistant U.S. Attorney, and look at me in a trial and de denigrate me the way that you did to J.D. Rivera from Pensacola or the way you denigrated Stephen Horn from Raleigh, North Carolina in their trials and belittled them for their journalistic efforts and their voice for what they did because it's not the same anymore. You've got this old archaic view and we're going to stop that from this point forward, going forward, if you decide to come against me in court. We're going to put that back on you and we're going to educate you on what the new media is. Because while we're growing and our voices are growing and millions of people are following our blogs and our sub stacks and our locals, et cetera, et cetera, Washington Post is laying people off by the hundreds. The old media is dying. We're the new voice. It looks different, sounds different. You may not like what we have to say, but we still have the First Amendment to protect us. Real quickly, I just want to go back to a couple of these guys I've mentioned already. I want to talk about J.D. Rivera from Pensacola. He was the first person in the panhandle of Florida to, to be arrested for uh, January 6 crimes. He had over 20 agents show up at his doorstep early in the morning in a raid and put the red dots on his family, his children, his wife, and visiting family as well that were staying there with him. What was his crime? He was a professional, or is, a professional videographer, photojournalist, who showed up at the Capitol that day with his big professional gear, and then he followed the story where the story went. When the story went through a broken window, he and another journalist who submitted his story to the New Yorker by the name of Luke Mogelson, they went through the same broken window. Luke went through with his cell phone. In fact, he famously said in the video, with the videos he captured inside the Senate of the QAnon shaman praying and singing and chanting in the, the Senate chamber, he said, I used my cell phone as a journalist notebook. J.D. was there with his big professional gear, contracted by a television station out of Mobile, Alabama. J.D. didn't chant. He didn't say USA, USA. He didn't say stop the steal. He didn't say whose house, our house. No chance whatsoever. And he and Luke basically paralleled each other through the Capitol that day. Luke submitted his story to the New Yorker entitled Among the Insurrectionists. Well, that was his get out of jail free card. JD driving home on the 7th of January, talking to the television station. They're excited. You got all this film. You were there. You went inside. They, they can't wait to take this film that he has and put it on the air. J.D. gets home, never hears from the television station again. And as I've mentioned before, these individuals with long rifles, red dots, show up from the government, these government agencies, and they arrest him and they take him away. They charge him, not with felonies, not with violent insurrection. They charge him with a glorified trespassing charge. And he gets four misdemeanors. He says, well, if you're not going to charge Luke Mogelson, then I'm going to go to trial and I'm going to let my voice be heard and I'm going to defend myself. This is selective prosecution at its best. And that's what I'm going to do. And he went to trial. He was convicted. Months later, he was sentenced to eight months in prison. 
rather than sending him to a minimum security camp just outside of his home in Pensacola where his family could visit him, they sent him to a medium security facility in Georgia where the first thing they did is they threw this misdemeanor defendant, journalist, into uh, solitary confinement for two months. He got four days of sunshine in his first two months in prison. Four days. When he was released into the general population, he then had to convince the violent felons who were there, the professional criminals, that he was only a misdemeanor defendant because they said to him, you're lying. Uh, misdemeanor defendants don't come to this jail. They don't send them to the prison. We know, we're, we're, we're pros. This is what we do for a living. We, you don't, misdemeanor defendants only. Well, you are if you're a January 6th defendant. That's how you're treated. Thankfully, J.D.'s back home with his family now. He served his time. Stephen Horn, young independent journalist, was only 22 years old on January 6th. He had been acquiring and accumulating press passes and badges for events he had been covering all the way back to when he was 16 years old. And I've seen his dossier. I've seen the motions that his, his uh, attorneys filed on a selective prosecution basis to show the court that he had a history of doing journalism and that that was why he was there that day. But here's what happened. When they filed that motion, the judge, a Trump supported, uh, Trump appointed judge, by the way, Judge Kelly, denied him and his defense team the right to show his history of journalism to that jury, was not allowed to show him those press badges that he had accumulated since he was 16 years old. And instead, those prosecutors belittled him, denigrated him, and absolutely destroyed any possibility of the jury, of D.C. jury, even considering the, the notion that he might be a legitimate journalist. You know what his biggest mistake was that day? In order to blend in with the crowd at one point, one time, all day long, captured on his own camera, he said three deadly words. He said, USA, USA, USA. And for that reason right there and that reason alone, he was not granted the <laughs> designation of being a journalist. He was a participant in the riot as a result of that. And that's the guys that we're here to talk about today, not just myself. My case has been being investigated, we know, for at least two and a half years. And we've heard the story. You've seen the press release. The guys have talked about it. I don't need to review any more of that. I just want to say this in closing, is that we're going to continue doing the work, even if the Department of Justice decides to move forward, finally, then I'm not going to stop working. I'm not going to stop telling the stories that we're telling. I'm not going to stop telling the stories about January 6th. I'm not going to start stop talking about the stories we know about the malfeasance coming out of the Department of Justice. I'm not going to stop talking about the stories and stop revealing the information that we have, particularly related to the case that three of these four gentlemen participated in um, a year and a quarter ago. We have the information that shows that the Oath Keepers were framed. We know who the Star Chamber is. We know who sat on it. And we have more blockbuster information, particularly as it relates to Special Agent David Lazarus of the United States Capitol Police and former Officer Harry Dunn of the United States Capitol Police, now congressional candidate. And the fact that these two men, we know now, should never have been allowed in that courtroom. First of all, they should not have been members of the Capitol Police or officers of the Capitol Police on January 6, 2021 because of disciplinary actions that they had against them years ago that were suppressed, hidden, not given to the attorneys in discovery through Brady violations by the Department of Justice. I know Brad's a little bit nicer to him than I am. Where is he? There he is. But we're going to be revealing these stories, these documents, and this information why not only should those officers not even been officers on the force at that time, 
They should never have been allowed to testify. And at the very least, these guys behind me should have had that information so that they could have impeached those testimonies when they gave them in that trial. So we're not going to stop. Thank you guys so much for your time and and uh, listening to what we have to say today. My last message is directly to the Department of Justice. Let me do my job if you really believe in justice, if you really believe in the truth, leave me alone. If not, if this is the fight you want, then let's rumble. <laughs>